Okay, we'll head right at the top of the hour, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Well, happy Friday, everybody, um, at the end of another, you know, pretty intense and very, very busy week for everyone. I just want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today for this important webinar on COVID-19, Navigating New Federal Policies, Regulations, and Programs to Support Rural Hospitals and Clinics. I hope everybody's doing well um, during this time of really a lot of nonstop change. Um, I'm Kate Stenyam, and I'm a program manager with the Delta Region Community Health Systems Development Program, uh, which is providing this webinar today. The Delta program is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy in collaboration with the Delta Regional Authority. Um, before we go, I know Rock has a lot of information to get through today, but before we get started on today's webinar, I wanted to put in a plug for some more upcoming Delta webinars. A lot of you were on the call last Friday with BKD to learn about the billing and coding um, for telehealth for Medicare, and we continue to get a lot of questions and concerns around this issue. So. Therefore, to support our Delta hospitals and clinics in this grant program, uh, we're working with BKD to pull together individual state resources that are going to include Medicare telehealth billing and coding information as well as state-specific Medicaid telehealth billing and coding information. Um, these resources are targeted for completion on May 15th, and they're going to include uh, the links to the um, COVID-19 billing source documents, the CPT and HCPCS codes, the ICD-10, um, CM diagnosis codes, documentation requirements, modifiers, the CMS-1500 claim place of service codes, the UB-04 claim revenue codes, eligible, eligible providers, and eligible telehealth um, or virtual communication services. So they'll include a wealth of information for everybody. Um, Seneca Hassman will be distributing these resources via email, so please be on the lookout for those coming in through your inbox. And then to follow up on the resources, the Delta program is going to be hosting webinars with BKD to really dig into the state-specific Medicaid telehealth billing and coding. And these webinars are going to be held on May 19th and May 20th, and they're going to be broken down by states that have similar Medicaid programs. So please be on the lookout for those invitations from Cinema Hackman to participate in those trainings. She'll be sending out more information on that. Um, so as a reminder, the webinar today is being recorded, and it's going to be posted to our website. So Cineva will be sending the recording and the slides to all the participants. We encourage questions and discussion. So to unmute your phone, you press star 2. If you want to ask, ask a question over the phone, press star 2. Or you can utilize that chat box over on the left-hand side right there. And then before we get started, as always, we like to take a minute to for all of you to find that chat box on the left-hand side and type in your name, your title, and your organization. That really helps our presenter and everybody on the call get a good feel of the audience that is on the webinar today. So again, find that chat box on the left-hand side, and if you could type in your name, your title, and your organization, that would be really helpful. So without further ado, many of you have known Brock Slavoff for years. But for those of you who have not had the pleasure to meet Brock, I'm going to do a brief introduction. Brock is the Senior Vice President of Member Services at the National Rural Health Association. The National Rural Health Association is a national nonprofit membership organization with a mission to provide leadership on rural health issues through advocacy, communications, education, and research. Brock joined NRHA in 2008. In age, but prior to joining NRHA, Brock was a rural hospital administrator in Mississippi for more than 21 years. So with the inundation of information coming at all of us like a total fire hose lately, um, today Brock is going to really provide that insight 
and detail that all of you need to be aware of to adjust these changes and also to ask questions. So Brock has been closely monitoring, I know, these updates from CMS and the federal government and has received many questions regarding funding components and how this will really affect our rural hospitals and clinics. So we know that this has been rapidly changing, so a huge thank you to Brock and everyone at NRHA for keeping up to date on this and sharing this information to really support rural. And with that, I am going to be quiet now, and I'm going to turn things over to Brock to get started. Well, thank you, Kate, and uh, welcome, everybody, to the call this morning. Good morning. Um, I am uh, pleased to be here, and certainly as a uh, person who used to live in this region for uh, being a hospital administrator, I want to do a shout-out to all my friends uh, uh, in the Delta region, and particularly those in Mississippi, where I've spent, as Kate said, over 20 years. Uh, this has been a remarkable time. I was just uh, thinking about the fact that my last road trip was uh, March the 5th, when I was with the uh, fine folks in the state of Arkansas, and uh, we spent some time there on Pettit Mountain um, forming the Arkansas Rural Health Association. So they have a brand new organization there, and we're so, so proud of them um, in terms of them uh, getting their start. Um, but it is fascinating uh, that uh, when I was putting this PowerPoint uh, presentation together for you all today, uh, how uh, indeed the world has really changed as we know it. Um, my PowerPoint is nothing like it was in March, and so uh, uh, today we're in May, uh, looking at uh, a post uh, uh, a COVID response world that uh, certainly is putting us into a different frame of thinking. So this is a map of our membership, and I couldn't go on very far without uh, thanking everyone on the call for your uh, participation in our association which we uh, think uh, makes your voice louder uh, in terms of our advocacy, both at the state and national level. Uh, here is a, a, a venue of our uh, events coming up uh, in terms of uh, educational. And I am sad to say that we were supposed to be together in uh, a week after next in San Diego in person. Uh, but because of the circumstances, as I know you all are aware, we uh, canceled our on-site meeting. Uh, we will be meeting virtually, though, June 16 to 19, and you can go to our website at ruralhealthweb.org and register for that experience. This will be the first time we've done an entire conference uh, in a virtual setting. And then uh, we're hopeful and uh, certainly looking forward uh, to, and it would be a glorious time to see everyone in, in person September 22 to 25 for the Rural Health Conference and the Critical Access Hospital Conference uh, in Kansas City. So I'm dividing up my presentation into two phases, before corona and after corona. So I'm just going to do a quick a history of where we've gotten from, where we've come from, uh, before I launch into some of the uh, various uh, details about uh, the post-COVID uh, uh, world. So we have health disparities. Uh, you see here older, poorer, sicker, with higher comorbid comorbidities, and then obviously we have less uh, access to care in terms of the primary care providers, dental or oral health access, and mental health providers. Uh, so this chart uh, documents, I think, the disparities that we see between rural and urban. Here we have the prevalence of Medicare patients with six or more chronic conditions. If you've seen me speak before, you've seen this slide. Uh, many of our, uh, many of my colleagues at NRHK uses this slide as 
well. I think that what it does is uh, to just set in your mind this frame of what it is that we in uh, rural health have to uh, uh, think about when we look at policy prescriptions for, uh, for solutions to problems. Uh, this is certainly stunning when you look at uh, the states going from Texas to Louisiana up through the deep south, Appalachia, and into the northeast. And this complicates the care that you all are delivering every day in the Delta region. And so when we talk with our legislators in Washington, we certainly have to put into context the environment in which every one of our members works and lives, including those here in the Delta region. And you can see the disparities that exist in terms of how sick and how prevalent chronic disease is in these regions. Uh, one of the elements, and we're seeing some huge increases in this as we see uh, the out, out after corona, and that is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, other, uh, or SNAP, otherwise known as food stamps. And um, this, this was a map from, this is a map from USDA, and it shows the concentration of food insecure places in the United States. And you can see again in the Delta region how prominent uh, the more red would mean the higher uh, a number of uh, patients or, or citizens that are uh, receiving SNAP benefits. And you can see how the correlation between health and food insecurity could be a, very, a really big issue. And so when we look at this map, uh, it is really interesting now to see after uh, we've entered into the after corona uh, environment, uh, this has only been exacerbated. Uh, exacerbated. Uh, this has grown and, and we're seeing uh, food lines for donation, for donated food of like a mile, two miles long. Uh, as unemployment uh, continues to rise. Uh, in the area of specific services, before corona, uh, we were concentrating on obstetrical, access to obstetrical care as a major problem that we were looking at. And you can see here that since 2011, over 155 rural communities lost access uh, to obstetrical services. And we know that uh, once the mother is uh, drawn to another location for services, and often uh, they may continue uh, to get services in, in uh, more urban or suburban areas as a result. And so this is an important metric. Uh, we hope to get back to this uh, subject really soon uh, because this certainly is, has not improved uh, after corona. So when you look at the environment that you all are working in and dealing in before corona, um, it was health disparities, populations migrating, recruitment, workforce issues, uh, health care policies from Washington and your state governments that are uh, urban-centric, uh, that do not favor uh, small volume rural facilities, and then economic policies that uh, further deteriorate our ability to uh, be of service to our citizens. So in um, this is some statistics uh, before corona, 76% uh, of revenues associated with rural hospitals is in the outpatient space. Uh, that's just really remarkable. Uh, when I started in the business uh, way too long ago, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, and I got to my hospital in Mississippi. Uh, it wasn't unusual in that day and age to see outpatient percentages of 25 and 30 percent. Um, here uh, you can see how we've just gone to an outpatient-centric uh, environment. And then here's the concentration of the map that Chartist Advantage has done for us, which shows um, the relative percentages in terms of coloring. So if you're in a state um, like Iowa or Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, you can see that they're up to 
80, maybe more than 90 percent, uh, 86 percent of their population, of their rural hospital revenue are in the outpatient space. When we look at days in cash on hand, uh, this is particularly relevant as we look at uh, the after corona experience. Uh, before corona, the average rural hospital in the United States, both CAH and rural uh, PPS hospital, had 33 days of cash on hand. Um, you can see here the states that have um, 0 to 19 is the, the average, is, is the darker colors. Uh, you can see Mississippi, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, uh, are states that are certainly uh, less than this average of 33 days. Uh, this really shows to us that when we went into the COVID emergency, um, I knew immediately, based on this kind of data, that we were going to have to get cash in the doors for rural hospitals as we saw the post-COVID uh, uh, world shaping up. Uh, we needed to get cash out to hospitals quickly. And so you can see here uh, why we felt that was so much the case. And then looking at operating margins, 48% uh, of rural hospitals have had before corona negative operating margins. And here's the distribution of that by state. And you can see Kansas and Alabama with the two states uh, that have uh, above 80% of their facilities that are operating in a negative uh, fashion. Um, you can see then the percentages uh, in the deep south where the Delta region is largely located up through Missouri, uh, Iowa, uh, Missouri, Illinois. Uh, you can see the darker color of blue, uh, not as bad as Kansas or Alabama, but necessarily it's, uh, it's not a good number in any circumstance. And then we look, uh, we've been looking at the closures of hospitals in uh, the United States since 2010, and we're at 128. We've had two or three closures since the corona uh, outbreak, since the public health emergency was, uh, was announced in March. Uh, those, one was in uh, Tennessee and two in West Virginia. So when we look at this map, you can see that Texas and Tennessee are the two states that have the highest numbers of closures. Um, Mississippi, Alabama, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri are states uh, that you can see that uh, have, high, have had higher numbers of closures in those states as well. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, and this was a source of a lot of my attention prior to the COVID outbreak, is the predictors of hospital closure. And our friends at Chartist Advantage Health Analytics did a study, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I would be happy to follow up with some more detail if anybody's interested after the call. Um, these are the variables that Chartist Advantage came up with that were correlated statistically significantly uh, with closure. And those are the ones that are in bold text. So it's the average age of the plant, case mix index, government control status, percentage capital efficiency, percentage change to total revenue, occupancy, outpatient revenue, system of affiliation, and state level Medicaid expansion. I'll just explain a couple of those since uh, we're brief on time today uh, to give you a flavor for what we've been uh, uh, seeing. So being located in a Medicaid expansion state actually decreases the likelihood of closure by 62.3%. So we're seeing here that through statistics, uh, there is a correlation between Medicaid expansion and rural hospital stability. A government control status was shown to decrease the likelihood of closure by 70%. What that means is, is if you're in a hospital that's owned by a local government, uh, either county or a district, uh, perhaps 
perhaps having access to taxation uh, subsidy or tax, tax support. Uh, these are facilities that are able to withstand um, the uh, onslaught of the pressures uh, that they're facing. Uh, interestingly, system affiliation was shown to decrease the likelihood of closure by nearly 50 percent. Uh, so there's some uh, interesting data here that uh, suggests that possibly system affiliation is positively correlated uh, with um, uh, low, low closure rates. And then one percent increase in the percentage change in total revenue can decrease the likelihood of closure by three percent, and a one percent increase in the proportion of outpatient revenue decreases the likelihood of closure by four percent. What I would say in response to this is, and I know that uh, the Delta Project uh, team works really hard with you all as participants uh, to increase your market share. What can you do to prevent the out-migration of patients from your community? So anytime you can uh, increase your total revenue, uh, that automatically decreases your likelihood of closure. So these are important elements to think about when you're looking at your strategic plan. Uh, vulnerability by the numbers, 453 rural hospitals before corona uh, are vulnerable to closure. Uh, 216 of those we consider to be most vulnerable before corona. Um, 97 of the 216 are critical access hospitals, 119 are PPS. 75% uh, of our vulnerable, most vulnerable hospital lists are in states that have not expanded Medicaid. I think that's a significant detail um, that uh, we were and are using in some of our advocacy. 76% uh, do not have government control status, which is the other variable uh, that we looked at uh, in this regard. So rural hospital vulnerability by state, I won't spend a lot of time here except to say that um, over 46 for over 46 percent of hospitals in the state of Alabama, uh, a very dark color, uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, uh, have concentrations of hospitals that are more vulnerable uh, to closure than other states uh, in the rest of the country. So this is why this Delta project is so important. Uh, and I think the uh, access to services that it provides in terms of operational and networking support is certainly very critical uh, uh, resources for your uh, consideration. Uh, there's a crisis in rural emergency medical services before corona. Uh, communities across the country are seeing shortages of emergency services personnel. Uh, we have a policy brief in, our, in my presentation slides that you have access to. Uh, you, can, you can actually link to all of these uh, live links here uh, to be able to uh, learn more. So now an environmental scan after corona. And I think that uh, what I wanted to do is spend some time looking at uh, some of the disparities that we see between rural and urban on the spread of the coronavirus uh, in, uh, in, in the United States. So Kaiser Family Foundation just published um, late last week uh, data in early this week that suggests that Non-metro counties, or in uh, in uh, official language, it's rural uh, for those of us on the call. Um, the number of new cases uh, in the uh, in the uh, United States, the, the fastest growing places for those is in rural areas. So you see the one week increase in cases, 45 percent for rural. And then if we look at the two-week increases in the number of deaths uh, for the week ending day, April, April 27th, we see a huge increase in the number of deaths for those that uh, whose addresses originate in non-metro counties. So we're seeing now that uh, rural is starting to overtake 
some of the statistics in terms of uh, both the incidence and in case fatality. Um, University of North Carolina just published this data. This is not in your slide set yet. Um, the, uh, we, I got clearance to show these today. Uh, then by next week, uh, they'll be able to be distributed. Um, but what I wanted to show here is the blue colors, uh, and it may be hard for you to see in, in your, on your screen, the blue colors are rural places. Western Kansas and Oklahoma, Central Iowa, Central Mississippi, and Southwest Georgia. Um, look at the line for Western Kansas and Oklahoma. These are the cases per 100,000 residents. And you can see the rapid increase in Southwest, in Western Kansas and Oklahoma uh, to almost overtaking the New Orleans area in terms of the cases for 100,000. So we're seeing some upticks in regions of the country uh, that are very significant, and they're mostly related around meatpacking plants, prisons, and then if there's large nursing home or long-term care population. So those seem to be the three uh, places where we're seeing the largest increases in places where those occur. Then we look at the U.S. rural county seven-day change per capita. So this is another. This is the biggest changes that are occurring uh, in counties, and we can see translating that first graph I showed you how the rural counties are showing the biggest change in a seven-day period ended, in this case, last week. And so, again, you can see the correlation to southwest Kansas, uh, western Oklahoma, north, northwestern Oklahoma. There are places in central Mississippi, uh, if you look really closely there, uh, that are showing some rapid increases uh, in the seven-day change per capita and uh, it almost to the 100% increase in the number of those uh, infected. Now, this is an interesting graph. I'm not going to spend a long time on it, but I would encourage you to study it uh, maybe on your own, particularly for your state. Um, what, our team, what the team did at UNC did was they took each state and they did median operating margins of the facilities of the hospitals in that state and overlaid that with the COVID-19 Community Vulnerability Index. And uh, you can look up uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the footnotes about what the, the uh, Coronavirus Vulnerability Index is. It's just an index of the burden of the COVID disease in that particular state. And if you're in the upper left quadrant, that means that there is a high burden of the COVID-related diseases, and then that's correlated with hospitals that are showing a worse operating margin. And so if you're in Texas, Tennessee, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Kansas, that's the quadrant where we're correlating the two statistics and noting that the hospitals are vulnerable, but they have high need areas in terms of COVID. So we're going to be using some of this in our advocacy going forward, and uh, this will be some very important details as well. We start to, in future phases of our work, uh, target resources uh, to where they may be needed uh, the most in terms of the impact. Um, when we look at the spread of COVID around the United States, uh, this was a scene outside of a small rural town in South Dakota. Uh, they were warning travelers to continue to drive on by. Do not stop. Our community is preventing the spread of COVID-19. 
Um, I think that uh, this is a really kind of humorous sentiment on one level, uh, but given the rise of COVID in rural, I think that there's some uh, real truth here in terms of the content of that sign. But what we say is that the rural fractures have only widened the uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic. So what the epidemic has done to us is just really widened the fracture that already existed uh, in, in rural communities. And I don't need to go over all, all this. I did in the introduction, but between workforce, technology, and reimbursement, those are the areas where I think that we have the worst problem uh, in rural communities. So we're looking now at reimbursement and finances, and I call it the COVID paradox. Uh, CDC and CMS recommended to you all in healthcare facilities to discontinue all elective and non-emergent care. And what that did was basically cause a hemorrhaging of cash uh, for these already vulnerable rural hospitals. And there was an acute need of support um, to get the money out to hospitals. And then we had the tyranny of efficiency. So our mark, the market place for healthcare in this country for the last two decades has really focused on efficiency as being the primary goal. And so we've seen declining inpatient status, I already documented the high uh, outpatient services. Uh, in 1978, the United States had over a million and a half hospital beds. Today, that's less than 900,000. Uh, we've had supply chain improvements in this country that feature just-in-time efficiencies, which now we look at that and we wonder why we ever thought that was a good thing as we're running out of uh, personal protective equipment and testing supplies. So after Corona, uh, this system that was designed for routine efficiencies are being surveilled severely stressed in the era of pandemic. So when we look at one of the indicators for COVID disease is the need for a high need for intensive care beds. But what we know, and I've been telling the press constantly when they call to us, is that 61% of rural hospitals do not have an intensive care unit. In fact, at my hospital in Mississippi, we had two ventilators, and uh, I always thought that that was too, too many, uh, because any time we had a ventilator patient uh, need, the, the, it was always usually that the patient was really highly acute um, and needed more tertiary level services. And so when we look at hospitals in the age of COVID, we have to really be dependent a lot on um, the transfer and the regionalization of health care to be able to get patients the care that they need at the level that they need it. But of course, not all COVID care needs to be transferred. Uh, some of it is effectively managed at the local level. We just have to know the right mix and match of those services. But what's happened in most rural areas is that they've seen the decrease in uh, volume because, of course, they've not been uh, uh, they've been uh, 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 distancing themselves from elective procedures. So CMS has uh, basically issued the notice uh, going into some of the post-COVID. Uh, uh, world of, of issues. Uh, CMS in late April uh, issued the notice that you can begin reopening your services to elective and non-emergent services. Um, some of the key elements to control community spread are testing, tracing, treatment, and vaccine. Um, unfortunately, uh, many rural communities are behind on their ability to do testing. Uh, certainly, contact tracing is not something that many public health departments or even local health departments are focusing on in 
terms of the rural aspect of that. And then we need better treatments for COVID. Uh, hopefully, researchers are working on that to get the treatments needed to make the disease not nearly as uh, severe as it is for a lot of patients. And then ultimately, to control community spread, we're going to need a vaccine uh, that's going to uh, be able to get us to uh, herd immunity uh, much faster. And so uh, we're hopeful that that process can be curtailed. But I will caution, uh, many vaccines will take three to four years for development uh, before they're fully tested and fully seen to be effective. So I think we need to adjust our expectations and move up the ladder, uh, move back to the beginning to the testing and tracing. Uh, in order to reopen, we need a lot more of that to be able to control community spread. Um, here's a live link to the CMS document on how to reopen your facilities uh, to elective procedures. Uh, here's just a summary that you need to document adequate uh, workforce testing and supplies. You need to coordinate uh, across the, your workforce, across the phases of care, so that you can make sure you have the uh, available individuals. And then in, in a coordination with the state and local public health officials, evaluate the incidents and trends for COVID-19 and restarting in-person care uh, can begin after these elements have been, uh, have been made. But I would encourage you to look at your uh, incidence and prevalence of COVID-19 in your service area and look at reopening your services, assuming you have the proper workforce and PPE available uh, to do that. So now we're going to go to the first polling question. And uh, the, the question is, and your response is requested, is your hospital or clinic planning to reopen elective or non-emergent services soon per CMS guidelines? Hi, this is Lori Clinton. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so that was a question, and I'm working up a policy right now, and yes, our plan is to reopen elective surgeries on um, Monday the 11th. Good. We've been in contact with several different people um, as far as uh, health care workers go. And we've reviewed our policies and procedures with them. And we're following all the rules and the regulations. And 100% of all of our elective cases will be tested, 100% of them. We have a checklist of all of the required elements that we would need to have in place prior to even considering electives. So we're doing all of that and, and got a way to screen the patients to determine uh, elective versus urgent or emergent, and we have a definition written out in our protocol. So that's our plan for Monday the 11th. Oh, that's uh, really good. I'm glad you shared that. I think that um, the only thing I would add is uh, a, a technique or a process on a periodic basis to evaluate community spread um, and just uh, noting those statistics and you know, if you see spikes, uh, then obviously you you may want to reevaluate. But that sounds beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we meet on that every day and review the statistics. And we have had a 14-day decline, but all of oh, that yeah. is documented. You know, Dan Walker is is in charge of our COVID team, so we are also keeping track of all of that as well. Wonderful. 
Well, it sounds like you're on the right track, and that's a good best practice in order to uh, set the standard for uh, uh, reopening those services. Thank you. So now, in terms of the COVID-19 response on after after Corona, uh, we're going to be working hard on um, basically the threats to rural America at NRHA. Uh, we have a resource center. This is a live link to that. You can also reach it on our, our main web page. Uh, partnering with federal agencies, we've been working really closely with HHS, CMS, FEMA, ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for uh, uh, Planning Response. I mean, there's just all kinds of uh, interactions we've had over over the last several months. Uh, we've provided TA uh, to rural providers um, on conditions of participation that were issued by the president. Uh, curating membership listserv. If, if you're a member, you could, you were part of the listserv, and we've generated uh, over well probably a well over a thousand now, it's maybe getting up to two thousand it seems uh, entries and spreading best practices. So that's what we've been trying to do over the last couple of months. So here's a um, just a partial list. You all know this well. Um, uh, the 1135 waivers that CMS issued. Um, I'm going to spend just a minute. You had a webinar last week in the Delta region from BKD. Great folks. Um, and then so they went over all of these details, uh, and hopefully you learned quite a bit about those. Um, as you know, Rural Health Clinic and federally qualified health centers were established as distance sites under the CARES Act uh, 3.0, and we were very pleased to get that status uh, in place. Um, that took some work. Unfortunately, uh, the bill itself, the legislative language, suggests or insists that the bill for these services goes to Part B. And for those of you that know, for rural health clinics and federally qualified health centers, um, that really doesn't work well because that does not acknowledge or represent your actual uh, encounter cost in the RHC or your PPS rate in the FQHC. So many of you will probably see a big delta, a big change between what Part B pays, which is $92.03 a visit, and what your encounter rate or your PPS rate is. And so um, this, this is unfortunately the way that uh, the legislation was written. Um, we are now planning uh, to make sure that uh, this is extended. So just for your information, the a uh, guy, the, the uh, uh, for your ability in a rural health clinic or an FQHC to bill these telehealth services at the distance site will expire at the end of the current public health emergency. So that means that, that let's say that the public health emergency for COVID ends up. Uh, January 1st of 2021, that means that the authority for rural health clinics and FQHCs to bill as distance sites uh, will expire. So we will be working very hard to try to make sure that this survives the public health emergency. In other words, we want this to be uh, authorized after the PHG. And at the same time, we're going to need to work hard and we'll need your help 
to make sure the legislation includes language that represents the encounter rate and the PPS rate for RHCs and FQHCs. So, so that's going to be a legislative lift. It's going to be a heavy lift uh, for us, um, and, and uh, we'll need your help on that. One of the things that I'm really concerned about is, is that because this is built to Part B, and because it is not considered a Part A rural health clinic or, uh, or an FGOAC service, uh, at least in the RHC world, it would, these services will not count towards the productivity of the requirement for participation as a rural health clinic. So the number is, I think, 4,200 and 2,100 visits, uh, 4,200 for the physician, uh, 2,100 or so for the, for the nurse practitioner. Uh, because of the really low volumes this year, when we closed our clinic, to elective and non-emergency services, um, we could see some uh, really low, low volumes uh, coming out in the cost reports for fiscal year end coming up. And so we're going to be looking for a waiver on the productivity screen uh, for rural health clinics. So just to let you to kind of anticipate this and, and to make sure that um, uh, you're, you're acknowledging that this, this is a problem and we're going to hopefully get a waiver for this year at least on the, uh, on the productivity requirement. Um, earlier, uh, at the end of um, March, uh, the first the part of April, um, CMS announced the Medicare Accelerated Advanced Payment Program. Uh, this was uh, CMS's attempt immediately after the uh, onset of COVID-19 to get cash out the door. Uh, CMS announced that this program is going to end soon. So uh, um, I've understood that it's already ended uh, for some, and so uh, the uh, billions of dollars have been forwarded to rural hospitals as a result of this program. NRHA is going to be advocating in COVID 4.0, this is the next bill that Congress will be considering. Uh, we're going to be advocating for um, <coughs> those funds to be forgiven uh, as part of our COVID relief process. So, so if you received uh, three or $400,000 or more in the first, in COVID, COVID 3.0, or, or in the uh, advanced and accelerated payment program, uh, we're looking to get those forgiven. Um, we've received initial indication from some of our rural-friendly senators that they are already talking about this, and um, they feel kindly disposed to including something, uh, including this in the COVID 4.0 legislation that they're meeting now to address. So stay tuned on that. We'll need your advocacy assistance um, in, in writing your senators and congressmen. In fact, feel free to do that now, uh, asking Congress to consider forgiving uh, the Medicare Accelerated Advanced Payment that you received earlier. So here's polling question number two. Did your hospital or clinic apply for and receive a, a, a SBA 
small business uh, uh, association payroll protection program or PPP loan. Brock, this is Joshua Gilmore with the Iron County Medical Center. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing better. So uh, we, we did apply for and receive the SBA protection loan. Um, however, uh, that being said, after we got our, our deposit, from the $10 billion that they had set aside for rural health, we turned around and sent it back. Um, they've got more and more strings attached to it, and, and um, after analyzing the total funds that had been made available, we didn't feel we could you know, hang on to that in, in good faith and justify the need for it after the, the other dollars were freed up. So but it, it is an, it's a good question, but it's uh, also one, one that I would say you should caveat with, with are, are you going to keep it? Yeah, yeah. This, this has been a question of a lot, a lot of people lately, and I um, and I sympathize with the decision making process there because it's not, not exactly clear right now. Um, so just to kind of announce the results, uh, seventy-eight percent of you said that, that you did receive and 13% have not applied. Um, I will say just really quickly as we return to the uh, slides um, that the, there is still money left and uh, to your point Joshua, we've got um, calls coming up on Monday and Tuesday that you may have seen a literature on. Um, if you didn't receive it, uh, let me know. I'll be glad to send you the regional list of, of, uh, of, uh, of the SBA, uh, NRHA, uh, uh, PPP programming. So basically, we're going to have SBA folks on the line on Monday and Tuesday to go over the points that Joshua made in terms of uh, what are going to be those requirements and documentation to demonstrate need. And that's going to be an important question. Um, we're seeking guidance from the uh, SBA to make that analysis over a protracted period of time. So in other words, instead of looking at the need just based on uh, May the 8th, um, what is, our, is my cash flow going to look like for the next 12 to 18 months without any future infusions of cash and recognizing what exists today, for example, the accelerated and 
advanced payment program is a returnable situation. So in other words, right now you have to return uh, for most people um, the money that was forwarded in the advanced and accelerated payment. So when you net all of that out, how does that look in terms of your cash flow going 12 to 18 months? And we use the argument with SBA that you have to look at where the hospital came into this with. So if you were already losing a million dollars or half a million dollars before Corona, then you have to add that to your numbers in order to get a true picture of where the hospital is at today. So we're looking for SBA to make a much more protracted analysis of how they define and document the need that will have to be made this summer for the work that they're doing. So I hope that that explains a little, little bit about what these programs are going to be. Uh, your point, Josh, was well taken, and then I think that those will be good questions to ask on the call next week as to how they'll define that. Uh, so that's some, uh, and we can, at the Q&A part today, we can talk Um, I, I have all of the listing of things that I thought about when I put this together earlier this week. I did not have the information on the SBA and HA webinars that are on Monday and Tuesday of next week. I didn't have that yet, so I didn't put that in here. Um, but are working on all of this and uh, COVID 3.5 had some legislation that added more money which made it uh, go around. It's going fast but there's still some left. If you haven't applied yet I would highly encourage you to um, especially if we can get this more longer look at need and um, make sure that we can use this money to not only fulfill needs for today, but what about 12 months from now? Um, SBA extends repayment dates uh, for the same 